time the message was titled, A Lot Going On, and there was a lot going on. Uh, Jesus was preparing to partake of the Passover with his disciples. Uh, the Lord's Supper is instituted. John's Gospel, we covered John. It's on the website if you'd like to check it out for free. Uh, the, all of John's teachings or John's uh, discussion about Jesus' teachings, the foot washing that Jesus did happened at this point in time too. So, you know, there was just a lot of things happening at the same time. And I think what's really remarkable for those that maybe you're not sure about the things of God, maybe kind of prove it to me attitude, which sort of was me back in the day, uh, is that there was a, a sliver of time that Christ had to come in the first century. And we believe it was April 6, 32 AD, where he had to present himself, himself in the triumphal entry. And that was for all the way back in the Old Testament from Daniel's prophecy. A lot of intricacies here. In addition to that, there was one Passover that when Jesus was on the earth that he celebrated, which was the Passover that he would be crucified at. Again, that was a sliver of time. We see him speaking to his disciples about this Passover meaning so much to him to celebrate with his disciples. Not a few hours from then, he would be crucified. You know, even uh, it was last Sunday, the, the world celebrated Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. But if you actually look up what the Old Testament says, it was very specific, right? There had to be a temple, there had to be a high priesthood, the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat, right? So, you know, things have changed over the years, but God's word never changes. However, Jesus took that transition. When the priesthood was uh, abolished and the temple was, was raised to the ground, Jesus had taken that, right, prior to that, uh, that that sacrifice, substitutionary atonement for our sins. So there is, there is a lot going on in the scripture. Uh, today the message is titled, Ministering Through Trials. So here, again, these last few hours before the crucifixion, there's, there's a lot of things happening. Um, unfortunately for Jesus, he had to deal with betrayal, right? From somebody who saw the miracles, walked with him for three plus years. He had to deal with some infighting. He had to deal with pride. He had to deal with uh, ego, right? so, but he was ministering through these trials. He could have just said, you know, everybody, I'm going to be crucified soon. Can you guys all knock it off and just focus on me? But you know what Jesus taught us? He taught us to be other-centered. He taught how to strengthen the church for when he would be physically taken uh, from his followers. And you know, it is a good lesson for us today because sometimes there are some who maybe in the church, who, you know, want to get involved, want to volunteer, but everything's got to be perfect. Perfect conditions, otherwise they won't volunteer, they won't serve. You well, know, if you look at Jesus' uh, you know, example to us, that's not the way he did it. And we're going to look at it in four parts. So jumping in, chapter 22, verse 21, it says... But behold, Jesus says, Behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined by prophecy. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do such a thing. So Jesus brings this up the night before. He shares it with his disciples, and if you put yourself in their shoes, they'd be like, wow, who, who could do such a thing? You know, we, we know he, he raised a man who was dead four days in the tomb. How could you turn on him? How could you betray him? Uh, so one out of four is the prophecy of the betrayal fulfilled while Judas was at the table. And again, it was determined by prophecy. God knows the future. Now, this is a discussion for like theologians like to have. We still have free will. But God knows the decisions we're going to make, right? He does try to reason with us. He try, does try to get us closer to him. But ultimately, we're free moral agents. So it was determined. And I think the sad thing with Judas was that he couldn't be deterred. Now, this is just conjecture, and I like to throw in some interesting discussions. Could Judas have you know, set everything in motion. We already know by this time he went to the religious leaders. He said, I'll, I'll give up Jesus, right? There's a discussion that happens. 
There's a price that's fixed for his betrayal. Could he have done all that? And then Jesus kind of tries to just win him with love, and we're going to see that. And then he repents. So prophecy gets fulfilled, but Judas is still saved. We don't know. Uh, we'll read more later on about Judas. He's, you know, he does end up taking his life. Uh, we don't know where his heart is. He didn't write a memoir. Uh, but it's an interesting discussion in you know, prophecy and free will. So I look at it this way. Jesus knew who betrayed him. He was steadfast to go to the cross. Uh, but I still believe that he was still trying to save Judas. And that's a very interesting point, right? He came to die for everyone's sins, including Judas's, right? I believe, and I talk to some of my friends who have, you know, doctorate theology degrees, we believe that uh, Judas was there, and Jesus, Jesus washed his feet along with the other disciples. Wow, that's, that's personal. That's, when, you, when you study that, that's actually, uh, there's so much uh, symbolism there. His teachings on koinonia and closeness with each other and the koinonia, that communion, that closeness with God. So I would say that if, if Jesus tried to save Judas, then nobody is outside the possibility of being saved. Now this is strange, and I felt like I needed to put this in here. In Matthew's Gospel, 26-25, you know, there's a, there's a little kerfuffle going on when Jesus announces that there's, he's going to be betrayed, and it was somebody there. So in Matthew 26, we see something very subtle. Judas turns to Jesus, and when you look at how the table is set up, it does appear that Judas was sitting out on one side of Jesus. There was two seats, that, or two places, that if Jesus was there, if they were eating dinner with him, um, two spots, so to speak, and it does appear that Judas was in one of those spots, right next to Jesus. Judas turns to Jesus and says, Is it I? Of course, he knows it's him. Is he messing with him? Is he trying to see that, does he know divinely that, that he did it? And Jesus, I believe, said quietly to Judas, and he did say this, he said to Judas, you said it, <laughs> you know. Um, I believe that, again, Jesus was still trying to love Judas. Uh, I believe that he didn't say it out loud. Yeah, it's you. And out him, because probably knowing Peter, he would have given Judas a beatdown, right? So when Jesus knew the personality of all the people at the table. He knows us. He knows our framework. Um, so I think even in those moments, my opinion is that uh, he's still trying to win him. And I hear people say, you're a pastor, you have a church, you don't know what I've done, you don't know how bad my heart is, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know, I don't belong in church. And I would say, if Jesus was trying to win Judas, what could you have done worse than that? So uh, that's what I love about our Lord. Uh, there's, no, there's no one's outside that possibility of salvation, no matter where you are in life, what you've done, what you're doing now. Right? He loves you when he died for your sins. A few life, life lessons here is, you know, on a smaller scale, this is actually, I believe, I, I'll look in one of the dictionaries, I should have done this, that... There's actually a word called Judas, right? So 2,000 years later, you're at work, and you, you know, you're both, you and your co-worker are applying for a position, and they sabotage you, and you say, oh, that person judas me. So we will see in life that, you know, some of you are laughing, it might have happened to you, that somebody tries to take your legs out from under you, either to make you look bad or make them look better. So it could happen professionally, it could happen socially, it could happen in ministry. I've seen churches split apart over these dumb factions where people are just vying for... It's a church. It's not a Fortune 500 company, you know? Uh, so, but really, when a crisis takes place, it really shows us what a person is made of. Are they, are they for themselves, or are they really seriously a follower of Christ? Right? There's a lot of tests. We're going to look at Jesus speaking about Peter and saying, you know, you're going to be sifted, and we're going to talk about what that means. We're all going to be put to a test. And I think sometimes it's not like God's playing games with us. I think I was put to many tests earlier on in my Christian walk um, and, you know, even through my life. And really it gets to show us about ourselves what we're made of. So those tests are actually good. God already knows what we're made of. Sometimes we need to see what are we made of and how can we change to get better. So we'll move on to the next section, verse 24. 
It says, there was also a dispute among them <laughs> as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Now, this is the disciples talking. This is the A-team, right? And he, you know, looking at what the disciples did, there was, I felt there was hope for me. I wanted to get involved in ministry. If there were 12 perfect people uh, with Jesus and there were many women followers as well, I would have been like, that's not for me. I would have been one of those people in that category. But I saw, you know, th these guys are frail. I mean, these guys, they walked with Jesus. They ate with him. They took naps with him. And still they behaved like this at some time. So it, it makes me feel better <laughs> about myself. Uh, it says, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles, think about this today, the kings of, or the unbelievers or the secular world exercise, exercise lordship or authority over the people. And those who exercise authority over them are called, or they want to be called, benefactors or philanthropists. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater? He who sits at the table or he who serves. Now remember, Jesus is reflecting a cultural norm. People will misread the scripture on purpose. Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And that last verse is really, when you look at the millennial kingdom, you look at the afterlife, uh, it was more of a sort of an organizational governance kind of thing. Uh, and that word judge, some people immediately go, but that word judge has a very large semantic range. So judging today could mean I went to a 4-H and I judged among the, the pies that people, the homemade pies, and I said, this one's the best. Nobody gets hurt, right? That same word in context, all the way on the other end of the scale, can have to do with something only reserved for God, judging for sin. And then there's everything in between. Typical governance, how does God want us to, and we see this with the Apostle Paul. And um, So I just want to make sure, some people read that and they go, wow, that's unsettling, but it's not, it's not what you would necessarily think based on the context of the scripture and the semantic range of the word. So two out of four is great in God's eyes, right? Powerful teachings, object lessons by Christ, shares with his disciples, and this is how they behave. <laughs> You know, how did it start? Um, again, I like to just th kind of, you know, say to myself, I wonder why this happened right after Jesus said this. What was the, what was the issue? And it's quite possible that the disciples were attempting to prove, right, that they would never betray Jesus after he spoke about the traitor. So, and who knows, would we do the same thing? Well, he goes, no, it's, it's definitely not me. You know, you should have seen me at, uh, with Jesus, and, you know, I, I held the bags, and, you know. So we don't know, but it does look like they um, were trying to prove that they weren't the one, right? Because they didn't know that it was Judas. But unfortunately for them, we see this a few times in the Gospels where they let things get to their head a little bit, and Jesus had to rebuke them. Um, and some of these object lessons didn't sink in until many years later. Actually, Pastor Vinny is going through the book of Acts on Wednesday night, and it's a totally different group of, of followers, men and women, uh, that did amazing things uh, when Jesus had ascended into heaven. They, he was not physically with them anymore. But they had learned enough lessons from him, enough teachings, enough parables, enough symbolism, where they actually did some great things serving lo the Lord and the people. So verse 25 um, I have to laugh. I'm going to wade into some territory here, and then I'm going to wade out, but I just can't help. Uh, this is actually unique to Luke's Gospels, Luke's Gospel, and if I read it again, and I paraphrase it with the words, uh, basically he says that the, the rulers of the unsaved world exercise control over their people, yet those same people want to be called philanthropists or benefactors. Sounds like government, doesn't it? <laughs> We're doing this for you, you know what I'm saying? We recently had a, a senator, sadly, who was indicted. They found gold bars and hundreds of thousands of dollars and whatever. Hope he gets a fair trial. But 
you know, some of these people, they get into office and they, they, they get power, right? And they um, almost deceive themselves into thinking, remember, it's called public what? Public, thank you, well, you all know that one. I hope you all go out and vote, right? Uh, public service, you're supposed to serve the public. But I think after a few, maybe decades or so, people forget what the mission is. But let me throw this in there. It's a lot worse when religious leaders do this kind of stuff, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Because we're supposed to be setting the example. And you see this. You, all you do is, is watch, follow certain high-profile people, and you know they have their own hairstylists, their own chefs, their own manicurists, um, foot rubbers. Uh, they, they, serve, they sit at the table, and they're served as if they're lordship. Um, and again, listen, I know people who have businesses and made plenty of money. God bless them. They earned it. They deserve it. But if you are getting wealthy and pampered uh, off the back of Jesus Christ, I have a problem with that. And honestly, I can't even listen to somebody who is that same type of person. But we, we see this. And we, it's, what's really kind of weird is when secular leaders and religious leaders get together and the people say, hey, food prices are up, fuel prices, fentanyl deaths, um, you know, a thousand kids missing in Ohio just this, this year, right? These are the concerns that the people have, and they say, oh, globalism. <laughs> just, we'll tell you what to think, and you'll be happy with us, and you'll like it. That's problematic, but it happens everywhere. It happens here, it happens overseas. Jesus told us that these things would happen, but he said, if you're one of my followers, this should not be named among you. And when people do come to me and they say, well, they have a problem with religion, I get it. I don't bark back at them. I usually say, read some of the scripture. So somebody who's hostile towards the faith, right? This is part of what I do. You know, they come with their complaints and I get it. And I'll have them read some scripture, things that Jesus said about that type of religious leader. And I say to them, you're closer to Jesus than you think because he didn't like it either. So he said to his followers, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to ascend into heaven. You need to do the job that I've called you to do. In verse 26 through 27, Jesus gives us three examples in that culture. Things have changed, right? It's been two millennia. In that culture, at that time, how does the world see greatness? Number one, the older would have the privilege. There was a certain magical age back then. Maybe it was the graying of your hair. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, right? <laughs> uh, and that you had privilege in that culture. And the younger would naturally serve the older. And that older person might not have had good character. But Jesus is just telling us what was going on at the time. B, one who governs, uh, who has power over one who serves. Obviously, the one who governs going to have that privilege, right, over the one who serves. Or C, and C, is the one who sits at the table versus the one who serves. But Jesus said, I've come to serve, right? He said before in other scriptures, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And this was something he needed to impress upon his followers, right? Are we serving or are we vying like the rest of the world is for status and wealth, wanting to be at the table? And i got to be honest with you, when I first became a Christian and I heard some of this stuff, it did rub me the wrong way. And I'm just being honest with you because it went against my flesh. Because I was in the world. And just like people in the world, we think about how do we get into the rat race to get what we want out of life. And for everybody, it's a few different things. Um, and then I become a Christian, and I'm slowly starting to absorb the Lord's teachings. But I never thought of myself being a servant. That's not what I want. I want to make money so that I could just pay people to do this stuff for me. It just, it's everybody's fault when they don't know the Lord. However, things have changed over the years. <laughs> Usually mo our Monday morning staff meeting, staff, our staff gets together tomorrow morning, we talk about what might have gone wrong on Sunday, what needs to be fixed in the church, you know, the HVA systems, and you know, is there a leak somewhere? And I come in with sweats, uh, 
probably usually a ripped t-shirt, unshaven. One lady pulled up to the church. This was on a Monday. It was great. And I was outside doing something. She came up to me. She thought I was the maintenance man. (laughs) She goes, I'm sorry. I'm here to see the senior pastor. I'm like, I smiled. I'm like, that's me. I said, we wear a lot of hats around here. But I, I feel good about that. I wouldn't have felt good about that 25 years ago. I'd be like, that's not my job, right? People say that in the, in the secular world. It's not my job, man, <laughs> right? Um, but this is, this is what you have. If we could put the meme up. So I'm sure many of you have seen this. It's a really interesting meme. And it tells a, it tells a great story. So this is a boss, right? He's up there. He's being pulled by the workers. And he's pointing his finger. It's very expressive. And he's telling them what to do. This is the mission. Go do that. Right? I'm the boss sitting in my seat. Down here is, here's a leader. He's not sitting up here. He's not being pulled. He's actually at the head of the pack pulling with the ones he works with, getting the job done. And I like being this guy as much as I can. I wouldn't ask anybody to do anything that I haven't already done or am willing to do. And you all know, right? You all know. Some of you shake your heads. You go to work tomorrow, and you got some people that are in the chariot, and you got some people pulling on a rope with you, in front of you, leading the way. And that's what Jesus, I don't really know where this came from, but uh, to me, a picture is worth a thousand words. Amen? So, as Christians, have we got the idea when we read about Jesus washing the disciples' feet, Peter was so taken aback because it was such a menial task in that culture, right? Today you can go somewhere and pay somebody to wash your feet, right? It's just, or rub your feet. But back then it was a menial task. And again, it was that culture that when Jesus girded himself, took out the the cloth and the water and was starting to wash their dirty feet, open-toed sandals, hot climate, sweat, walking through dusty, I mean, their feet were filthy. And Jesus goes to wash Peter's feet. He, he balks at it. it. It bothers him. He saw Jesus raise the dead. He saw Jesus heal the lepers. No, certainly not, Lord. You, he's, he's emphatic about not wanting the Lord to wash his feet because of the cultural implications to it. And he said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. Right? It was something that we needed to get. I'll tell you a funny story. Even when I worked in my secular job as a police officer, uh, I had great supervisors, and then some that weren't so great. And the great supervisors, I would go over and above to do what they asked me to do because they were the ones pulling, right? They were the leaders. Uh, But there was this one supervisor, you know, you've seen it in your workplace, and he got promoted a few times, and... um, I never say names, but he would drive around, and he would, after a snowstorm, 24 hours, there was the statute, township statute, you had to have your sidewalk cleaned of snow. And he would go out there, like clockwork, and he'd drive around, and he'd call out the district cars to go ticket the people whose sidewalks had snow on it. Well, it is the law. But I knew intuitively that either the person was probably elderly, disabled, or couldn't afford to have their uh, sidewalks clean, right? So I would go to the house, and it's funny, I never wrote a ticket for it, right? I'd go to the house, knock on the door. Remember one elderly woman came to the door. I said, listen, ma'am, you're supposed to clean the sidewalk of snow. I said, do you have a snow shovel? She said, yes. I said, well, hurry up and give it to me. I've got to work quickly. (laughs) And I did this a few times. I would, in uniform, I would, just so happy to do it. And then they, I'd come back, and how many tickets did you write for cleaning uh, the snow off the sidewalks? I'm like, none. What do you mean, none? I called it out. I said, I know, but when I got there, it, it was clean. So how can I write a ticket for something that was clean? So, um, yeah, we, I had a lot of moments like that in my job. But, I, you know, you could throw your back out. It could be a, a, a insurance thing and a lawsuit. I'm like, okay, yeah, all right. But don't, don't, don't send me to write tickets to elderly people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So you wonder why Pastor Joe never got promoted when he was uh, on the force. So somebody actually said to me I was unsupervisable. But, <laughs> but in a good way, you know, in a good way, right? Okay, let's get off of that. 
Uh, but it, listen, when I first started the career, I was not like that. You know, these are lessons that Jesus wants us to learn. People need to see if, if we have some status and we're doing something or ministering to somebody or giving an ear to somebody who's really going through a hard time when maybe the others don't want to deal with that person, um, they will see Christ's light in you. And that's the whole point. Eventually, hopefully, it leads to them understanding the way of salvation, that Christ came and died for their sins. Why are you like this? Because I'm learning from my Lord, from God himself taught me these things through the word. Uh, verse 28 through 30, the servant's reward. You know what Jesus said? And people will read this too quickly. He says that you will have a seat, right? You may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs and study the early church, and especially the apostles and the followers, uh, they had rough lives. You know, they didn't sit in the lap of luxury. They were too busy doing God's will. They were too busy serving. They were too busy uh, sharing the message of salvation. They were too busy turning the Roman world upside down because there was this new philosophy that people were gravitating toward because it gave the people hope. And that's, you can look up in the history books, the secular ones, and see the impact Christianity had on the Roman Empire. Eventually the Roman Empire just... It's disintegrated. But he was basically telling them, there is a reward, but don't expect it here. Unfortunately, the false teachers, you can go on YouTube, you can go, somebody says, hey, you got to check out this pastor. They're well pampered. Uh, they live a life of, of pamperedness and luxury. And they're preachers. And they want to tell you how you could be like them. How you could live your best life now. But I didn't see the disciples living their best life back then. Um, and they are false teachers because what they try to do is they, they marry American culture, the American dream. And again, I'm all for somebody who, you know, builds a business and works hard and God bless them. They, they earned it. Good for them. But they try to marry the American dream with the gospel. And basically, you have to keep going to God and telling them what you want. And you want that million dollar home or multi million dollar home inflation on the cul-de-sac, right? You want this. You want that promotion. It's almost like God's a genie in the bottle. So the Lord is saying, I've got work for you to do here. But the false teachers are saying, no, 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 no. Do everything you can do to become pampered here. And there's a, there's a conflict with those two philosophies. So again, it, that's why reading the Word of God is freedom. It's freedom, Right? Uh, who is greatest in any local church? One who emulates Jesus. Very simple. Right? And it's something that we always strive to do. It's attractive spiritually. Verse 31, continuing on, it says, And the Lord said, this is, this is amazing. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, that's Peter, right? Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, it indicates Peter is going to falter. Strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And I can imagine Peter either shocked or still argumentative. Because Peter was, I don't know, he's sort of type A type of guy. He's probably a fun guy to hang out with. Sometimes would speak before he thinks. Uh, maybe a little impulsive, but he had a good heart. Uh, but he, you know, he, <laughs> he's Peter, okay? You read the scripture, he's, you love him. Love him when you, when you read about it, and especially what happened after the ascension. So three out of four is no, not Peter too. Uh, in Matthew 26, again, Peter is more emphatic. So why was Peter so emphatic about this? Well, A, it was part of his personality. He's Peter, right? B, maybe he wanted to prove that he wasn't the snitch that Jesus was speaking about, right? Somebody's going to be, it wasn't me. Snitches get stitches, right? They stay on the street. It was not me. <laughs> but... Uh, I think Peter didn't know the depth of his own heart, right? And we see this in Jeremiah 17. And I learned, because I used to be like that. Um, oh, yeah, you know, it's, when it comes to spiritual things. And there were times that I failed. 
And then I read Jeremiah 17, and it says the heart is wicked. We don't even know our, our own heart. We can think one thing one time, and then there's enough pressure put on us, and we, we falter, you know, we, we fail. Right? It's the human condition. So there's this constant um, tug of war between what we want to do in our flesh, self-preservation, right, and what we want to do for the Lord. And sometimes those two things are in conflict, especially when we think of the martyrs. Uh, but the beautiful thing is that the Lord knows us, good and bad, and he still loves us. He wanted to restore Peter after he came back. And i got to tell you that in the last two weeks, I've had at least a handful, maybe six or more people come to me individually, quietly, and say, I'm not happy with myself, and really put themselves down. And I really, I'm happy to encourage them. And I'm going to say, you know what, the Lord knows. And, um, and I did say in Sunday's message, you got to hear it. Because Peter was, is looked at as one of the greatest disciples or apostles, and they were all equal. But he, we're, we're going to see the little silly thing that he denied the Lord three times. That's crazy. It's such a, a small trial that sent Peter literally running, right? So I just try to encourage people and say, you know, you, you, let's, let's get into that portion of Scripture. I really want to encourage you with that. Because even the A-team, and I, I say that facetiously, uh, they had their moments. They had their failures. And the Lord still loved them. And he still believed in them. Do you know that the Lord believes in us when we don't believe in ourselves? Man, that's powerful. That is really powerful. Read this again at home a few times and just let it sink in. What he's saying to Peter. He's not saying, Peter, you're going to flake Oh, I can't trust you. It's going to happen again, even after all I did. He didn't do that. He says, I'm praying for you. You're going to return and strengthen your brothers, right? Be an example. I know you can do it. I know you're a leader. Pretty wild. Verse 31, this is wild. He says, Satan has asked to sift you. In that culture, largely agrarian, depending on where you live, this is foreign to you. Um, how does the bread get to the supermarket on the shelf, right? It's a process. And they even do it now with modern equipment. So it's, you know, they put the, they thresh or they, they cut the, the wheat and they load it into a machine and out comes grain. And the unusable part is usually they do it for some, they put it somewhere else, right? Um, they can use all parts of it. But back in those days, it was the, the bran, right? The heart of the grain that was usable. And when you look at a stalk of wheat, what you're seeing is a lot of it that's really technically not usable. The part that's usual, usable is very small. So, and again, a lot of countries still do it like this. They take the, the wheat and they gather it up and they have a threshing floor. Right? We see this in the Old Testament. And they would literally beat the wheat. They would beat it and um, throw it up into the air. Uh, they would try to find a place where there was open on the sides at least, where there was wind coming through. And they would go through this process. It took a long time, right, for even a bushel of wheat to just beat it, and thresh it, uh, and then separate the unusable, which were usually lighter, so they, they would blow out, blow away easier, and the heavier part would stay there, and then they would have this usable grain. So it's a metaphor. Jesus loved to use metaphors. And he was saying to Peter is, you're going to be sifted. Right? You're going to be on the threshing floor, floor spiritually. And Jesus already knew what Peter was made of and what parts of him needed to go away, just like all of us, right, as Christians. There's parts of us that maybe we're stingy, maybe we're unforgiveness, maybe we're haughty, mean-spirited, whatever it is. If we grow in Christ, a lot of that stuff has to move out. Now, for some, right, some takes longer, some, go, some of these things go easier, some of them take years to accomplish. But Peter was going to be sifted. And he needed to see what he was made of. You know, it's happened to me. It will happen to all of you. Uh, Christianity, I like to say, is not a sprint. It's more of a cross country. You go and you go and you go until you go to be with the Lord. Right? This isn't something that's fleeting. It's not a fad. It's not a genre. It's a way of life. And many are like rising stars. I've seen it. 
and they're doing so much stuff, and they're, and I'll sometimes say, pump the brakes, slow down, pray more, talk to the Lord, you know, read. They just do, 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 and they, whoosh, shooting stars, and then they, they disappear. And that's not what we're called to do. So Peter had to run that long distance race for the Lord. It wasn't a sprint. And we're going to run into that as well. Um, you know, I've had situations, I'll, I'll share you one, it's actually a funny story, uh, where as, as a pastor, I've talked to people who I felt were starting to, like Peter, they were faltering in their faith. And it's intuitively, I know, they're going to disappear for a while. You just know it. You just know it after a while. And there was this young guy who I was discipling, and we had a great conversation not that long ago, and he, he got caught up in some things, and I, he started disappearing, right? He, he left the church, but he also left following the Lord because we talked afterwards. He disappeared. I couldn't get a hold of him. He was gone for years. And uh, a few years later, he actually calls me, and he's all nervous when he calls me. And he said, you know, everything you taught me was, was right. He goes, I got caught up in some stuff, things I already knew. And uh, so I said, so, so why are you calling me now? He said, well, I, I reconnected with the Lord, which is good. I got involved in a fellowship near me, which is good. I started serving, which is good, right? And he said, and I'm just trying to do the right thing, and people are gossiping about me, and they're saying things, and he, and he gets caught up, and he goes, and then the Lord convicted me and said, you did that to Pastor Joe. <laughs> I said, oh, wow, this is a great conversation. Tell me more, you know? But uh, it was cool. I said, do me a favor, keep my phone number. I said, you ever run into anything? I said, you call me. Because it isn't about, oh, he hurt my feelings, or he, it's not about me. It's about him and his Lord. It's just where he was in this church. This happens all over the place, right? And I can't tell you how many times I've had those face-to-face, -face, passionate conversations on the phone, sometimes guys, sometimes ladies, just trying to, to strengthen them and trying to keep them from where I know they're going. But I can tell you, I've gotten emails, phone calls, a lot of things from people years later who, like Peter, came back. And they don't have to come back here, but as long as they come back to the Lord, I'm happy right? We all work together, don't we? This, this thing about churches, you know, my church is better than your church, and this is sort of like a party spirit that we see in politics. As long as it's a solid church, it's teaching the Bible, it's discipling people, praise God. It is an awesome thing. So um, this is really a, a neat thing that we get to see. What are we made of, right? So Peter falters, but he comes back stronger. Verse 32, when you return to me, I'm sure Peter remembered that. He probably thought, well, I'm not going to leave you in the first place. But then he did. And then the Lord's words, this is the Lord Jesus talking to him. How do you forget his touching, beautiful, intimate words to you? When you return to me. Now, folks, it, this isn't just Peter. Because when you look at the Greek gr grammatical structure, right, it doesn't always come out in the English. Um, you is also plural. So in some, in some portions of this scripture. So he's saying to Peter and to all of them, Peter was, you know, he was a prominent figure in the 12. But he was letting them out, all the rest of them know that they were also going to be sifted. As a matter of fact, from what I read in Scripture, when I read all the Gospels, when Jesus was uh, being crucified, there was only one disciple, John, who was at the cross comforting Mary, right? Where'd the guys go? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'll never leave you. We're loyal. Well, gee, when the Romans get involved, you guys are all gone, hiding somewhere. The women were brave, though. They all were out there. They all came to the tomb, um, and they had wonderful, prominent places in, in the early church, which is great. Many of them are mentioned as well. So I would just say to you this morning, if you are either one of those people that spoke to me or one of those people that want to speak to me, it isn't me that's going to restore you. It isn't me that's going to save you. I'm just the vehicle. But Jesus is your greatest advocate. Not social media, not your clique, your friends. And they may be supportive, but it's Jesus who's looking always out for your best interests. Right? He's always cheering for you. He's always, he's like, I know the future. I'm, I'm, I'm in there in the trenches. I'm doing some spiritual warfare for you. Romans 8 says even the Holy Spirit, 
you know, makes intercession for us when we don't know what to do or what to say. You ever been in a trial that's so rough? Maybe you, you, you go, you take a walk, or you're in your car, and you just, you want to pray to God, and you go, there's just no words. You know, it's a personal trial. It's a health issue. It's something with your kids. A loved one passes away, right? And you want to pray. You make that connection, but just no words come out. The Lord is there. The Holy Spirit is there. And that's powerful. Amen? So, verse 33, Peter. I'm ready to go to prison and to death for you. Blustery words. Um, in a few hours, we'll see that some small trial takes him away from, you know, one of the servant girls says something, he's, and he gets scared. He gets, starts to panic. But we're going we're gonna to cover that when we get to it. So, verse 35. Continue on. Last few verses. It says, and when he said to them, and he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. Remember, he did miracles. He multiplied food. I mean, he, you know, could you imagine being with Jesus? You woke up and your, your back is sore and like, Jesus, I, I really want to go with you, but could you just touch my back? You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, they lack nothing. They didn't need money. <laughs> they didn't need doctors. They were, they were set, right? And possibly they got really used to that. This went on for years. Things are going to change when he's removed from the earth. He said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you, that which is written must be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. That actually comes from Isaiah 53. So it's a prophecy fulfilled. Jeez, everyone loves Jesus. They're hailing him, triumphal entry. By the end of the week, they're cheering on his crucifixion. Boy, the crowds are fickle, aren't they? Social media is fickle, isn't it? <laughs> don't live your life by Twitter. Or what is it called, X now? I don't know. I don't get into these things. But, you know, people's minds change. And he was letting them know, things are going to change very quickly. For the things concerning me have an end. So they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. <laughs> and he said to them, it is enough. Let's go through this. Four. The force field is lifted. It's the best one I could think of. You know, um, no problems while they were walking with Christ. Teaching, miracles, food multiplication, leftovers. If you like leftovers, that was great. There was always something left over. Nothing could stop him. Why? Because Jesus was on a divine time clock, and he had to go to the cross. He even said that. He even said that's why he came into the world, to die for our sins. But Jesus' ascension changed everything. Now they were subject to wild animals, hunger, lack, hostility, and things that plagued everyone else. Okay, there is, and this is the problem with people who read what they want to read out of Scripture. Some have read this, and got the impression that Jesus was trying to get Christians to start an army and fight the unbelievers. Wow, that's a wild imagination to take those few verses and run with that. Okay, what did they focus on? The swords. They didn't say anything about the money bag. They didn't say anything about the knapsacks, right? <laughs> and when you read the original language, it is enough. Not like, hey, that's good, you got two swords. He was referring to the conversation. Uh, it's enough. No more discussion on the subject. Um, so, you know, sometimes when we're put into a corner, it's easier to fight physically than to walk away. And you could see Peter in the garden will come to that where he draws his sword and Jesus makes him put his sword away because he totally misinterpreted what Jesus said, which was not uncommon. Verse 37, Jesus said that he would be numbered with the transgressors, Isaiah 53, 12. Right? For the things concerning me have an end, meaning his dispensation or his time on the earth. Prophesied in Daniel, there was a time that he was to come, time to present himself as the Messiah, time to be uh, given himself up to, to be crucified, shed his blood for the remission of sins, time to ascend Right after the resurrection, 40 days later, he ascends into heaven, boom, he sets the wheels in motion for the human element, after their training, 
to continue with this concept that we understand as the church, and we've been experiencing that for the last 2,000 years, some good and some bad, but Jesus didn't fail. You find a clergy leader doing something that's vile, I can find you a scripture where Jesus says not to do that. And you might think, oh, and I've seen this in the paper, the person was, uh, they passed away, and then they find out they did all these bad things. Now they've got to stand in front of God. Now, I'm not speaking for God, but he might say something like, you know what's going on right now, don't you? You totally misrepresented me. Don't try to hide behind the cross at this point. So, just my, just my conjecture. So, as we close, John's gospel, again, fills in some other things. And I'll just fill some in, things in quickly uh, before we close. John 13. So, this happens that same evening, right? They're in the upper room celebrating the Passover. Lord's Supper is being instituted. In John 13, Jesus tells the disciples, I have to go. And where I go, you cannot follow. Remember, he's going into the spiritual realm. They can't follow. They've got to stay here on the earth. John 14, really cool. I read this lot at funerals for believers. He says, but I'm not going to leave you orphans. Where I go, I'm going to my father, and my father's house has many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I can tell you, folks, when we pass, we know the Lord from this life to the next. If you like your house now, you're going to really like it in the afterlife. And I know for me, I do the carpentry, the concrete work. I actually did, uh, I waterproofed my basement. The sump pump kept filling up. I found where it was coming in. Uh, but I won't have to deal with that when I go find my new, you know, the windows don't have to be replaced. It's not drafty. Okay, enough of that subject. Just Jesus is basically saying, trust me, I'm going to come back for you and this is what I have prepared. All encouraging stuff. John 14, Jesus gives the promise of the Holy Spirit. Basically, Jesus saying, I'm not going to be here, but the Holy Spirit is going to come in an aggregate fashion. He's going to walk with you. He's going to you know, encourage you. He's going to advocate for you. They don't fully understand the Holy Spirit, but they will. John 15, he speaks about the vine and the branches. And this is good for us as well. Right? If we're going to bear fruit, if we're metaphorically a tree, spiritual tree, we have to be rooted into the vine to get our nutrients. Okay? Good stuff. And the foot washing, which was a, uh, a tactile or a tangible um, metaphor of servanthood, love, right? communion that night. That was something new. The Lord's Supper was instituted. We're going to partake of that after service. So let me just go back to this. What do we do when trials come? What do we do? Complain, scream, lose our minds. I found that, because I did that too, I found that it doesn't accomplish anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, we need to come and lean into the Lord. And, and I've seen this too. I, I'll see somebody at the food store, and they haven't been to church in a while. I'm very friendly. And nine times out of ten, they'll say, uh, going through something really bad. I'm like, well, then you've got to go back into fellowship. Encourage them, right? God loves you. You know, your, your brothers and sisters you know, want to help you out and pray for you. Um, and we'll, this is what we do as humans. We isolate ourselves. And that's dangerous spiritually, right? The, like the lioness. Satan is the lion. He picks off the stray gazelles that he sees that are not with the pack. And, and that lioness attacks them. And that's what Satan does. That's what the underworld does. And it just compounds the problem. And we fall and we fall and we fall. And I just was having a conversation with somebody recently, gently, and I said, you know, when we find ourselves far from God, God didn't move. He's a constant in the spiritual economy. When we find ourselves really far away, we moved. But God loves it when we come back to him. He's not going to be overbearing, but he's always going to be there for us. So what do we do? Well, we see what our Lord did, and we lean tightly into the Lord's bosom, and we know, based on the Scripture, that He loves us. So these, all these little instructions and metaphors and parables were not just for the Twelve. They were for us, too. Good lessons to learn. That's why it's so important to read the Word. So as we close this morning, what a blessing 
Jesus didn't go into selfish mode. He never did. He continued to serve. He continued to love. He continued to train. He continued to encourage. And I hope to encourage you with that this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you're so awesome and so good. And everything we read about you is, is wonderful, Lord. It's refreshing. It's powerful. Um, and I just pray if there's anybody here who, you know, could be here for the first time. Listen, in this church, there's no strings attached. As the worship team leads us, we just want to give you an opportunity to come to the front and receive Jesus. Very short. You can repeat the words after me. It's not a formula. It's what you mean in your heart. You're expressing, and this was me 28 years ago, sitting there thinking, okay, well, how do I, what do I do? So this is sort of an articulable way. So while they play, if you'd like to come forward, and like many have done before, I'll lead you in a prayer, and you just tell the Lord you want to receive him into your life, and he's, uh, he's ready to go. So you come if that's your desire. Anybody want to come forward, receive Christ? You know, you might be real close uh, to doing that, and you might say, you know, I still have some questions. I'm really, really liking the Word, liking learning about Jesus, but I have questions. So, you know, see me after service. We can chat. Um, love to get those questions answered. There's only everything good about receiving Christ into your life. Amen. So at this time, the... Uh, elements for communion will be distributed. <laughs> 